As Paul brings this epistle to a conclusion, he offers another three pleas to these Thessalonians at the end of this letter. The first one is to pray for Paul and his team. Pray for us, it says. The second is to show affection and have fellowship one with another. Verse 26, greet all the brethren with the holy kiss. And the third is to submit to God's word. Verse 27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle, the word of God, be read unto all the holy brethren. The Apostle Paul had not elevated himself to such a position. Yes, he was the, the great apostle in revelation to the Lord. He was, in, he was brought up, transported to heaven at one stage. Um, he seen a great work done. There was no greater servant of the Lord. But he never elevated himself or thought himself to be better than anyone else. He never thought himself to be superior or super spiritual above everyone else because in his humility here, and humility as Calvin says, Andre Murray is the greatest of all the virtues of the Christian walk, humility. We have to humble ourselves before the Lord. And the opposite of humility, of course, is pride, which God despises. But the Apostle Paul, in his humility here, he realizes and he requests to these Thessalonians the great need he has for their prayers. He says, Brethren, pray for us, a request for prayer. Brethren, pray for us. This was not unusual for the Apostle Paul to request this. This was a pattern. Of Paul's ministry. It was a pattern to notify believers from all different assemblies to pray for him as this was customary. It was a pattern, a customary practice of Paul that asked believers from at least five other assemblies to pray for him in Rome and Corinth and Ephesus and, and with the Philippians and Philippi and also with the Colossians, etc., etc., etc. This was a burden in the apostles' heart that the flock, the assembly, the church of Thessalonica would intercede for him before the Lord. They that pray to God lose no time. The most beneficial kind, folks, in life is praying to God. It is a great goodness privilege because of Christ. He's opened the way up that we can pray to the living God. It is the most blessed and beneficial kind of all is praying to God. How much will prayer warriors, people whom God knows who have sought him, will they be rewarded in glory? They that pray to God lose no time. Mankind is a moral kind. How are we using our kind? Are we redeeming our kind? Paul prayed here that these Thessalonians, this flock, this assembly will intercede for him before the Lord. The Apostle Paul was leaving no one out here. He was transformed. He just didn't go to the elders. Or the deacons of this church and this day would you pray for them? He didn't just single people out, nobody was transformed. As he mentioned, brethren here, which included every true believer in Christ. Paul requested to these Thessalonians that they would pray for us, not just him. Us, which is plural, not singular. This is plural, and Paul was including his co laborers, Silas and Timothy as well, who were engaged with Paul in his second mystery journey. These Thessalonians were indebted to Paul, to Silas and Timothy, as they brought the gospel to this city of Thessalonica. And God honored them, and God blessed them, and God saved these Thessalonians. 
And there was a church established, and they were a vibrant church that were evangelistic. They were a separated church, they were a servant church, or even a persecuted church. They weren't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Um, Paul and his team served them. They had time for them. So in return, because of these three faithful men, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, it was at least with gratitude that these Thessalonians could repay them by praying for them. The greatest thing of all folks is praying for someone. And I know people, yes, there's people who are genuine, and you know, you know when they come to you and say, I can pray for you, they do pray for you. But then there's all ones, I don't know, the Lord knows, but just say it so flippantly, and it's just off their tongue. But when you know someone's a man or a woman of prayer, dedicated in the quiet place, love to be in the Lord's presence, when, they, when you ask them to the pray for you, they, they know they will pray for you. Abraham prayed for Sodom. And God even, because of Abraham, because of his, of his, of his godliness, and because he was a man of faith in God, he was the friend of God. God, Abraham says that there's 50 in the spirit of the city. It shows you the power of prayer. God honors prayer, of course. Now, God has ordained his purposes and decrees. And of course, no one can divert them. God's perfect and wisdom and knowledge. But nevertheless, when a man and a woman is not place of prayer, not quiet place, in the mind of Christ, on the mind of the Spirit, they will be praying in the will of God, for the will of God to be done. The challenge is, how is my prayer life has increased? How is your prayer life has it increased? For my, this message of prayer keeps coming out over the last number of weeks. Folks, I can't emphasize enough how important prayer is as a food God has given us. And that is what is lacking in the evangelical church today. They're going around in circles in this country. There are programs and there are lovely buildings and their money, their everything, their whatever it is you want to call it. But folks, all of us just a flash. We need to get down to serious prayer. Anytime God is honored it, and we can't twist God's arm. We can't demand from God, but nevertheless, God has ordained his people to pray, and God does honor prayer, especially if they're praying in his will, he will answer. And any time, God, if you read the accounts, even in the scriptures, of course, which is our ultimate account, authority, and illustrations through the word, but also through church history, any time God has moved in great prayer for our power and nation, or among whoever, He's, 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 he's moving the power to save. Nevertheless, God's people have been hungry, they've been thirsty, they've been a devotional people, they've been, they've been hungry for God and thirsty for God, not shallow, not going through the motions. You see, they have been revived in their spirit, longing for God's glory. Not, and that's what prayer is ultimately about. It is ultimately about for God's glory. Raven Hill who was a man of prayer, who was an authority in prayer. He was in all night prayer meetings at the age of 14. Raven Hill says, you know someone's spiritual temperature by their prayer life. The challenge is, this morning, is your prayer life shallow or has it increased? Paul, the apostle, the great apostle even asked these Thessalonians, the prayer for him to pay me. The Apostle Paul was encouraging and instructing these Thessalonians to make prayer a habit, a pattern, a way of their life as prayer. And this verse is in the present tense, it's not past tense. He hasn't said, I thank you, you prayed for me. No, it's in the present tense. It's a pattern of life, it's a way of life. Be men and women of prayer constantly. He says here, doesn't he, in, in verse 17, pray without ceasing. Of course, we can't pray 24-7. But nevertheless, not 
is basically, uh, is, is, is Paul is instructing us that prayer should be a pattern of our life. And the Word of God tells us that the psalmist sat of himself aside three times a day. Daniel did as well. Three set times a day. Now it's not out of routine or ritual. But folks, what is lacking today in the evangelical church is the place of prayer. There is so much mechanics. I've been here, I've been on faith mission, I'm not going to do the faith mission themselves. But I've seen oh, many, many prayer meetings over the years, whether prayer unions or whatever church that is, all down through the years in different districts. Um, many, many, many prayer meetings is just going through the motions. People are only saying prayers. There's a difference in saying prayers on bread from the heart. Massive difference. It's mechanical, they're just saying the same stuff. I know it takes time. I'm not talking about young believers, by the way. I'm talking about people who are saved many years. We should, our prayer lives should be developing more and more and more. The more knowledge we have the Word of God, the, the more knowledge we should develop in the place of prayer. Is our prayers fervent? Or are they electrified by the Spirit of God? There's many saw the same in Greek prayer meetings and church satins as it looks, it's dead. It's just going through the motions. You have the same three or four people pray. You could have 40 or 50 people in the prayer meeting, that's fair enough, that's the place. But you have been that every single week the same three or four people pray, and that's it's just mechanical. And then a certain hand cut off, half nine, get that cut off. That's just going through the motions. That's just ritual. You know, son, there's no difference in the children of Israel when God says, I'm sick of your sacrifices. Because it wasn't from the heart, it was all out of the show. Folks, I cannot emphasize the most important part of the ministry your want is prayer. With the word, of course. And the word gives us many, many examples how to pray. Paul said to these young, these young converts of Thessalonica, pray for us. The Bible doesn't leave us in the dark regarding prayer. It gives us many examples how to pray. We need to pray one for another, of course. Especially for those who are in the front line of the battle. We must pray, folks, for our most importantly, what we need to pray for, of course, is God's glory. And how does God be glorified is through his people who are strong in the Lord and the power of his might, who have spurts of hunger and thirst, who are alive for the zeal, who know victory in Christ, that sin doesn't have dominion over us. And we need to pray for one another that we will walk closer to the Lord. That is the most important prayer of all. Even before about physical sickness, yes, you can pray for that, that has its place. But the most important Paul's prayers of the exilium was always through the believer that they would grow in grace, that the inner man would be strengthened by the Holy Ghost, that we would mature in our faith. And we need to pray for one another, especially those who are on the front line of the battle, like the Apostle Paul here, like Silas, like Timothy. A 19th century Presbyterian pastor in New York understood the vital role prayer has in spiritual warfare and made an impassioned plea for Christians to pray for their pastors by stating, oh, it is a fearful expense that ministers are ever allowed to enter the pulpit, pulpit without being preceded, accompanied and followed by the earnest prayers of God's people. It is no marvel that the pulpit is so powerless and ministers so often disheartened when there are so few to hold up their hands and prayer in the Lord's. The consequence of neglecting this duty is seen and felt in the spurts of the clashing of the churches. I wonder today, folks, and I say this in love, how many have prayed for me for the word of God and the grace of free course? I trust his love. 
Because we're in warfare. We're in a battle. Saw the Spurgeon, we all know, we've heard about it now, and these things are just coming to my head, and I haven't been down. Spurgeon, the way was such a success, of course, of God, or the end of it, of course, God was moving in great power in Victorian age, between Victorian's age, great power, great weapon in London, and all these places. Um, um, they came and they asked Spurgeon, young man, through preaching, 19 years old, preaching to 10,000 people. Ask them what is your success? Well, Spurgeon wasn't interested in success or numbers, but he just says, Come with me. And he says, There it is, there. People were in the place of prayer, 400 or 500 people on their knees while he was preaching. Sadly, in some cases, faithful pastors who are in the front line of the battle, and also other folk, not just pastors, of course. Evangelists, lead preachers, and others who are maybe not in full time ministry, but they're in the front line of the battle because they are walking closer to the Lord than many, many pastors. But saw in some cases, faithful pastors and servants of the Lord are more criticized than actually prayed for. But there's coming a great day of reckoning when. The people who criticize faithful pastors or servants of the Lord, they will be severely judged as they have slandered a faithful servant of God. It's a serious thing, folks, to slander a faithful servant of God. What did Jesus say to Saul of horses when he was on the road to Damascus? He basically says that he persecuted me when he was persecuting the church. So when someone is stronger than a faithful pastor or a faithful servant of the Lord, they're actually stronger than Jesus Christ. Because that faithful servant is, is a representative of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul suggested to these Thessalonians a number of issues that they should uphold themselves and the team in prayer for. First of all, that the word of God would have free course and spread rapidly. Secondly, Paul was praying here and asking these Thessalonians to pray for him uh, regarding his safety. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 1 and 2, read out to us, it says, Finally, brethren, pray for us. There's pray for us again. Pray for me, he says. Pray for Timothy, pray for Silas, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. So Paul was praying, asking Jesus to pray for him and his name that the word would have free course and spread rapidly, and also for his protection. Also, Paul, in other letters, was praying for the other churches to pray regarding wisdom, like you have wisdom and the sermon. One example is this, when Paul was collecting money from the Gentile churches, that he would have the wisdom to be able to distribute it properly to the church at Jerusalem when there was a famine in Jerusalem. Also, Paul asked them to pray that the word of God would be effective as he preached it, and that a door would open for him. And that he would be spiritually strengthened and make known the mystery of the gospel and what he preached. He prayed also that he would live out the vocation, walk worthy of the vocation he was called to, that he would walk in honor and integrity, blameless before the Lord and man for his glory, in case he became a castaway. That he would be writer of angels to pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience. In all things, willing to live honestly. You see, there's an integrity again. There's the message of holiness coming through again. Pray for us, the Hebrew writer says, and trust we will have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. Men and women of integrity. So God will be glorified. So Paul realized the very important role for these Thessalonians to pray for him and his name. Timothy and Silas, 
as well as pastors and faithful servants of the Lord who are in the very front line of the battle. Because when you're in the front line of the battle, think about it, the analogy is simple. In the physical realm, if you're in the front line of the battle, of course you're going to get more scars than everybody else who's way at the bottom. The way, who's way behind you. But we're all in a battle. We all need our prayers. Each one of us. We're called to be soldiers. Endure the hardness and be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But quickly as we move on there, we've we'll, we'll labored a wee bit on the subject for her, but nevertheless, we'll move on. The second request is for a faction. Paul exhorts these Thessalonians. The second request here, first of all, was pray for us. The second request is for a faction. Verse 26. Greet all the brethren with the holy kiss. A faction. Greet all the brethren with the holy kiss. Christian fellowship is essential and part of worship. Christian fellowship is essential and a part of worship. Of course, our fellowship is with the Lord first. Our devotional time is the most important with the Lord. But nevertheless, the Lord wants his people to have fellowship, come together one with another. He doesn't want us to be isolated. Believers should greet one another and encourage one another, especially when the corporate worship public meeting has ended. The congregation should not escape like rocks. Cannot wait to get the exit door as quickly as possible. No God has ordained fellowship. One with another, after all, the true church is meant to be a family, one body. Now, I don't get me wrong, so I was shown here this morning on the ceremonies, and I'm not getting anybody in that capacity, any person. Of course, they have to leave us to do it. But you know where I'm coming from? God's ordained fellowship for his people. We're one family, we're one body. And I have heard it very through the ages, through the years, with different people. You might be visiting them and you know they're struggling a bit. And they might say there's no love in this place. It's not just here, it's using this place. Or oh, there's no fellowship. Yet the bottom line is they're not willing to make the effort. They're on the fence, bench warmers. Yet, folks, this church has a time of fellowship every Sunday night. Immediately after the service, I understand Sunday mornings it's difficult to have fellowship with one another because well, we're going home together Sunday dinner and all that. I'm not going, but Sunday evening, there's fellowship immediately after the evening service. There's fellowship in this in the prayer meetings, there's two prayer meetings a week, there's even prayer meetings before the, the, the services. But there's two, four prayer meetings in total, of course, the two before the services, and then a prayer meeting on Tuesday night, and a prayer meeting on Thursday night, and after the prayer meetings, we have a time of fellowship. And folks, I cannot, in fact, the prayer again, I cannot encourage you yeah, enough to get to the place of prayer, because that's when you have true fellowship with the people of God, and you get to know what is happening really in the church. The same principle in life, generally speaking, this is what you invest in, is what you get out of. So we have fellowship with the public here every Sunday night after the church service. There's a cup of tea on Tuesday night, there's a cup of tea on Thursday night. That is the time, folks, to come and be gathered and praise God for the fellowship and the union and the love of this place the minute. May it continue. You see, fellowship is having time for one another. We're one body. We're in Christ, one spirit, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. And God has ordained fellowship with himself ultimately, of course, but also fellowship one with another. It is having time for one another. It's hearing each other out. It's building up relationships. It's getting to know each other. 
It's helping and trusting one another. It's encouraging one another. It's sharing and carrying each other's burdens as we rejoice with one another and also mourn with one another because we're in a fallen world. There's times of happiness and then there's times of sadness. Paul instructs these Thessalonians to greet all the brethren. Verse 26, greet all the brethren. This word greet conveys the idea of being friendly, warm towards each other, as no one is superior or inferior in the body of Christ. There should be no favoritism because of a person standing, but rather, whether they're in the community, whether they're a top businessman or popular in the community, or even if they're in a high position in the church setting, there should be no favoritism, there is no superiority or inferiority in the body of Christ. That's why, folks, Sunday nights, Sunday nights, people will clarify. Every time after the meeting, I'm in Lydia's holidays. I'm a bit of honor. I'm trying to encourage one another. On times talking about the scriptures, of course. We should treat each other equal and strive towards unity in the spirit and love. Not being critical or contentious or diverse, divisive. We should be encouragers because we belong to Christ. And the Bible makes it abundantly clear, fundamentally throughout, as far as the New Testament, of course the Old Testament is it, love the brethren, love one another. In Paul's day, the custom to greet one another, especially a superior, was to kiss a person on the foot, knee, elbow, or hand. Paul says here, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. In Paul's day, biblical times, the superior was greeted with a kiss on the foot, the knee, the elbow, or the hand. But friends kissed each other on the cheek, on the face, which was not a sensual thing, but was a symbol of genuine love and affection. Verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Today in our society, of course, of course in Western culture, we express affection normally by shaking hands or hugging someone. It was actually in the 13th century that the church abandoned the custom of recording a holy kiss on the, the face cheek as people started abusing this action. Of course, the most twisted, hideous display of this custom was found in Judas Iscariot in his high-handed hypocrisy who kissed the Lord in the cheek as a signal to the Lord's enemies for his arrest at the Garden of Gethsemane. Such wretched hypocrisy. Usually the custom was that men kissed the men and the women kissed the women with a holy kiss on the cheek which was supposed to be a genuine symbol of Christian fellowship and affection one for another as a cure for one another. But Paul's point is here, whatever form of affection you display, whether by a kiss or hugging or a handshake, it should be done in a controlled fashion. God's people should be warm. God's people should be joyful. We've already looked at that as a command, we looked at it a few weeks ago. It tells us here, and everything give thanks, rejoice in our Lord. God's people should be joyful, they should be warm, they should be loving, they should, because it's not our love, God's love is infused in us, supernatural love through the Holy Ghost. God's people should be caring. God's people should be sensitive one to another. Not cold, not hard, not stiff necked, as we should be filled with the Spirit, as the fruits of the Spirit should be added in our lives, which is beautiful and a 
attractive. When someone is warm and not contentious, there's an attraction to them. You want to be in their company. But when someone is cold and hard and twisted and divisive, you want to stay away from that. That's why Paul says, great affection. Have affection one for another. Love one another in the Lord. Finally, and clear here, Paul requests these Thessalonians to submit to God's word. Very quickly here, verse 27, submit to God's word. He says, I charge you, that is a strong word, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle, this word, this letter be read unto all the holy brethren. Paul reminds them at the very conclusion of this letter, the importance of the word of God. That the word of God has to have a prominent place that like prayer in their own lives as well as the local assembly of this America. It's not rocket science. I keep coming back. I've been preaching here for almost nearly four years and I keep coming back to God's words. Dear friends, it is prayer and it's the word of God. And it's applying that word obedience which creates faith in our lives. The walk in the path of the Holy Ghost for his glory. Yet many are trying this and that, and they're like religious salesmen, manipulation, thing nights and that nights, it's all flash. It's a common phenomenon. God has showed us the pattern. The word of God, you see, governs our conduct, it shapes our lives. The Word of God transforms us. The Word of God sanctifies us and increases our faith. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the Word of God. The Word of God guides us as a lamp under our feet and a light under our path. It instructs us and encourages us to the promises of this Word. It strengthens us. It transforms us. And ultimately, the purpose of the Word of God is for us to be more Christ-like and build our characters for the glory of God, more mature in our faith. God's word is pure and perfect and cannot be altered. The word of God does not change for society. Society needs to change to the word of God. It is always wise, the word of God. It is perfect and wise because God is all known and all wise. God cannot make any mistakes. And I've said it before. If people would only adhere and follow this book, it would keep them out of a lot of harm. Generally speaking, in a daily, daily way of life, of course, apart from the persecuted church. You see, God knows best. We are so limited. God is infinite. He's all wise, omniscient. He knows everything. Even the verse are headed upward. Who can instruct the ways of the Lord? No one's the Lord's instructor. He knows best, he's all wise, and his commandments are not grievous, and they're not. They're only grievous if you are playing about with sin, yielding to the flesh instead of to the spirit, then they become grievous and they rebuke you. But when you're walking in the light, God's commandments are not grievous, they're the light. To the believer of God's words to be precious to this very each believer. You see, this is the greatest possession we can handle. It is God's engrafted seed, which is in us every true believer, being born again, not of corruptible things, since the summer and gold, but born of the spirit, born of God's word, the eternal seed is in every true believer, is engrafted in us, which gives us wisdom which gives us light, which gives us discernment in these dark days we live in. I wonder today, is the word of God engrafted and planted into you? Are you saved? Are you born again? Has there been spiritual surgery taking place? Has there been spiritual circumcision? Are you truly in Christ, saved by His grace, going to glory, going to heaven? Has there been a time you've humbled yourself and repented and trusted in Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone, Is the engrafted seed of God's word in here? The apostle.
apostle Paul here means business here. He says here, he is forceful here. I charge you in verse 27. He is so convicted here. He is so intense that all these Thessalonians received the words of this letter read to them by imposing a solemn oath. Verse 27, I charge you, which means to bind with an oath. It is the same phrase Paul expresses to his young associate, Timothy, later on, who becomes a pastor at Ephesus. He says in 2 Timothy 4, to Timothy, I charge thee, preach the word. I charge thee, preach the word. Not, Timothy, your own words or ideas. Not your speculations. Not the words, philosophies. Not the words, stories. But the inerrant, eternal, indestructible word of God, which has the only authority and is all sufficient. When spiritual awakenings came, folks, the word of God was revived in the pulpit, the preaching of the word. How do they get back to preach the word? Paul charges these elders by a solemn oath in the person of the Lord himself in verse 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle, letter, be read on all the holy brethren. It's a solemn oath that this epistle must be read, heard, and applied to be in operation. Read means hear, a read the light, a read the loud. In public worship, hurl it out, be transformed, no hidden agenda, hurl the message out with conviction and authority. As no apologies, folks, when you preach the word of God, when you're doing outreach this week and you get in that conversation with anyone, there's no apologies for the gospel. What a message! It's obviously authority, but it's what does it become on? It's not hard for it. Never ever water down in the apostle for anyone. They need to apologize, not us. Because they're under sin. They're under wrath. They need to repent. And Paul is saying here, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read. It means further with conviction, with authority. Shout it out. God has ordained us by the foolishness of preaching. Read it out, heard it out, which was essential to the spiritual accountability of the early church as they did not have many copies of the Word of God. In fact, initially, at the beginning, there was only one treasured copy of this epistle, which made it impossible for everyone to read it individually. That's why they came together collectively. That's why it's important to come to the Lord's house consistently but to hear the, the, the word being expounded. What it means? That's what that means. Like expounding, expository preaching, expounding the word, folks, means explaining what it means. So it was essential, it was wise, it was practical to read this epistle in public to the whole congregation to gather. At once, which was so precious, it was a divine revelation from heaven that was true and authoritative and eternal from the pen of the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Ghost. As Paul himself said, all scripture from Genesis right through to Revelation is given by inspiration of God, all scripture, and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. You see, Scripture is profitable for doctrine. What is right? We need to know what is right. It is also profitable for reproof. What is not right? It is also profitable for correction. How to get right? It is also profitable for instruction in righteousness. How to stay right? What is right? What is not right? How to get right? And how to stay right? The true believer who studies and applies God's word will grow in faith and holiness and will avoid many pitfalls in this evil, corrupt world as a death and wickedness. The word of God is our roadmap for glory. How we treat the Bible is the way we treat Jesus Christ, who is the word. 
How are you treating the word of God today? Is it precious to you? Are you feeding of it daily by allowing it to transform, sanctify, and shape your life? Or are you just playing about with it from one week to another? Or are you Tory? Said many Christians are, are merely playing a Bible story. And therefore many Christians are merely weaklings when they might be jazz. To be strong in the Lord of the power of his might and to know victory over sin folks. You need to be a serious student of God's word and apply what it's telling you. There's no shortcuts. Find the air, time is run. All five months. Paul gives his benediction to these Thessalonians. In verse 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That's why we're singing the song of first time. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. It's benediction. Paul prays, desires of these Thessalonians to experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ being with them at all times. Grace is something we don't deserve. It is God's unmerited favour towards us. Grace is God's loving kindness, which summarises all that God provides believers in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul and many of his letters used the term grace at the beginning and closing of his letters. Grace is favour. Grace is kindness from God to man and providing for his spiritual needs in Christ. And all that is saving grace, but also is common grace to everyone who gives the son of the rain to the righteous and the unrighteous, handle of blessings, even to the unsaved. That's common grace. Grace is God's good gifts to men and which causes joy, especially the ultimate gift, is unspeakable and indescribable gift, the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Someone said, Grace is a ring of gold, and Christ is the sparkling diamond in that ring. Grace is a ring of gold and Christ is a sparkling diamond in that ring. You see, all our sufficiency is in Christ. It's all about Christ. From the beginning to the end, we are complete in Him. We have all things pertaining to the life and godliness in Christ. We have wisdom. We have righteousness. His righteousness has been imputed to our account. We're justified. We have sanctification in Him through the Spirit. And we have redemption. This old body will be redeemed someday. And we'll be washed in the body of Jesus Christ. Fit for heaven forever. Christ is no disappointment. He is precious to us. He should be precious to every believer. He should have preeminence, Lord of our lives. Taste and see the Lord is good. Christ, you see, satisfies as God continues to pour out his blessings towards his people, especially who are in Christ by expressing not only his amazing grace, but abounding grace as we are what we are by the grace of God. Praise his glorious name. So Paul at the end of this letter is declaring in God's favour and loving kindness continue to be with these Thessalonians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So for a church to function properly and spiritually grow, it is essential how our relationship fundamentally, first of all, is with Jesus Christ, our devotional time, of course, through prayer, through his word. And also, it is very important how our relationships is with one another for a church to grow spiritually. God is more interested, folks, not the size of the church, but the purity of the church. The pastor needs to feed the flock from the word of God, preach the word, and protect them the best he can, and not be deceived by false teachers. Verse 12, we seek see, brother, to know them which labor among you, as the pastor, and are over in you, the Lord, and admonish you. He admonishes us himself, first of all, and the flock through the word of God. The flock need to pray and share and encourage the pastor, verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. The congregation needs to help and support one another, have fellowship, verse 26, greet all the brethren with the holy kiss. The word of God needs to have primary place, preached and expounded, verse 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Despise not prophesy, verse 20. The church needs to be a praying people, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. 
The church needs to have wisdom and discernment. Verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. The church needs to be a grateful, thankful, and joyful people. Verse 16, rejoice in her more. Verse 18, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. The church needs to be hate and sin, no compromise with it, and pursuing holiness, walking in the light by being filled with the Spirit, not quenching or breathing the Spirit. Verse 19, quenching not the Spirit. Verse 23, this is our part, abstain from all appearance of evil. And verse 23, this is God working through us, the God of peace, sanctify you holy. I pray your own spirit, soul, body, be reserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, it's all about bringing glory to the Lord. And that's what this letter concludes with. Christ is coming. Christ is returning. And Paul has emphasized that God's people need to live in godly lives. Proper fellowship with the Lord in harmony and proper fellowship one with another. The Lord bless these three words to us today. I've said enough. I'm not saying our last time because time is gone. Have a word of prayer. Thank you for your patience. Father, as we conclude this meeting, we thank you for the many exhortations you give us from this great matter. And have us, Father, to be in an right relationship with thee. Father, give us even a more desire for the place of prayer. And, O oh God, for your word and the apply your word that would be more Christ like for your glory. And Father, we think that even the theme we've looked at this morning also regarding fellowship one with another. Help us, Father, to carry each other's burdens. Help us to love one another. Help us to be there for one another. And Father, when we realize we're, we're one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one body. And Lord God, I pray you would bless us from the youngest to the oldest here. Help, Father, I pray you shine your face upon us gather that we will grow in grace and we will be strengthened more and more in the Lord in these days. I pray, Lord God, now as we separate, I pray, Father, keep us in life here until we meet up again in sure will, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. Time is man. And uh, I'll trust you all to be better. <laughs>